Thank you, Asagi, Richard Hayes, and the staff of CGS for this opportunity to speak with you today. I stand here today as a career molecular biologist turned activist because of concerns of ethical and moral issues. While working in an embryonic stem cell lab at Pfizer, the largest pharmaceutical company in the world, I reported ongoing public health and safety concerns to management. I soon began to experience retaliation that escalated into hostility. Soon thereafter, I became the victim of the very safety violations I was trying to prevent. An untrained lab worker used a human infectious genetically engineered virus without suitable biocontainment on my personal workspace. I began experiencing periodic paralysis and spinal pain, a result consistent with the DNA coded effects that had been engineered within the pathogen. This experience of walking through the fire of being a whistleblower and an injured worker provided me a unique view into the social and political cultures within the biotech industry which hinder human rights and public health and safety. I hope my perspective today can contribute to connecting the dots to Terrytown to enhance the, the movement for the protection for both workers and the public. In April of 2010, an eight-member jury in the state of Connecticut unanimously ruled that Pfizer had retaliated against me and engaged in willful, malicious indifference toward my speech concerning public health and safety. This unanimous decision by a jury is very significant. It provides a clear example that if the general public ever does become aware of what is truly going on in the biotech industry, there will be an outcry. The public will quickly realize that self-policing and the lack of oversight within the biotech community are not providing adequate protection, protections for their safety, for their family safety, or for the public safety. So my trial outcome should give us all hope and confidence that if we engage in a well-orchestrated and strategic campaign towards public awareness, we could make a significant impact on the critical health and human rights concerns which underlie advanced biotechnologies. Now I say well-orchestrated for a reason. Because despite my story and other injured workers, biotech workers who have been made ill, maimed, or killed, we still face immense challenges to inform the public. The one challenge we all have in common is the state of affairs brought about by a biotech industry riddled with conflicts of interest and left to self-regulate. Network with, very with, with, a, with variety of businesses, academic institutes, and governments this complex of economic and political drivers makes for a formidable challenge to any would-be whistleblower, injured worker, or concerned citizen who makes attempts to play fair in bringing about safety or social and human rights balances. Now, one of the first barriers is finding affordable and quality legal help in a timely manner. The lack of experts and the economic disparity makes these high-risk cases. And although I am extremely grateful for winning my lawsuit, the economic reward, if it ever does come, comes after a long, difficult battle. Many would-be whistleblowers would not be able to endure the economic hardships it requires. With all these limitations, the vast majority of legitimate claims cannot be brought to justice or to the public's eye. Government agencies use revolving door policies to establish special economic relationships with business. This creates certain boundaries that will not be crossed at the expense of individual and public health rights, even to the point of disingenuous tactics. For example, during an interview session that I had with OSHA, I was guaranteed that my notebooks were safe as I left for a lunch break. But while away, the OSHA investigator nonetheless made a copy of all my attorney-client privilege documents from my personal notebook without my consent and without my knowledge. And then later in the investigation, OSHA demanded a settlement offer from me, only to use it afterwards to write in their report 
that I had a character flaw and I was out to get money. OSHA refused to follow statutory procedure, never performed a safety inspection or addressed my serious safety complaints, even with documents in hand showing serious biocontainment issues, exposures, and illnesses in our department at Pfizer. The end result is that government agencies act in capricious ways, providing no consistent platform or protection for injured workers or whistleblowers to speak freely and inform the public. And even more egregious against human rights, both federal OSHA and the Connecticut Workers' Compensation System established terrible precedents of denying the disclosure, disclosure of exposure records. These actions eliminated my rights and biotech workers' rights to independent directed medical care and to any remedy through workers' compensation. Consequently, injured workers, injured biotech workers like David Bell, who incur hundreds of thousands of dollars in medical bills, are forced onto social security disability at a cost to the public instead of the employer who engaged in unsafe work, uh, work practices. I also discovered walls of resistance amongst biomedical researchers within prominent academic institutes who partnered with Pfizer. Comparable to the overt anti-biotech crusaders who make grandiose and false claims that all genetically engineered products are harmful, these scientists who come bearing credentials and big salaries take the opposite extreme. They make overt, uh, overt statements claiming that all genetically engineered viruses used in BL2 labs are engineered to be safe and cannot cause harm. Statements that are patently irresponsible and unfounded in science. The biomedical industry has shown great confidence in using strategic alliances to manage their dirty laundry while moving on the fast track to profits over safety, all in the name of innovation. And why shouldn't this industry proceed with confidence? When Pfizer received a $1.37 million verdict against them at the conclusion of my trial, their stock didn't drop to reflect any consequences. In fact, soon after, many biomedical universities lined up with hands open wide to accept $100 million contract deals with Pfizer. The state of Connecticut ignored public health and safety concerns even after a Connecticut jury agreed that my safety complaints were of serious public concern. Instead, the state invited a Pfizer manager who had been intimately involved in the retaliation and safety abuses in my case to give a talk at, the, at this year's StemCon 2011 conference on the topic of stem cells for profit. With injured workers and whistleblowers up against significant legal and economic roadblocks created through a web of conflicts of interest and the rare legal victories not changing bad behavior, we need to engage in a collective and strategic campaign to protect public health and safety. The facial expressions from the jurors at my trial told a story of disbelief and shock. I have confidence with, the, with effective public awareness, the health and safety and human rights concerns within advanced biotechnologies will begin to be addressed. So if we are to connect the dots, let us connect with open dialogue and let us network to build capacity and to form a strategic framework to increase public awareness. Thank you.